because I wasn't always like the instigator. You know, I wasn't the one selling drugs. I was the one, like I was never the leader, so to speak. I was always following. But whenever you're sort of caught up in that pattern, you have to give consent. You know, you have to like agree to do all those things. So I was responsible, guilty by association. And that was a big thing that I found and discovered in my yoga practice that, you know, there's a saying that the Buddha has, it says, if you find yourself walking with fools, it's better to walk alone. That's MC Yogi. And I'm Brian Falchuk. The Do A Day Podcast. Will you hear from the most inspiring people who have been through hard times, overcome them, and have turned around to help others with what they've learned? I'm your host, Brian Falchuk. I know because I've lived it myself. I've written about it in my book, Do A Day, and that's why I'm bringing you this show. Remember, today's a new day. Go out and do it. Hey, day doers. Brian Falchuk here with an episode of the Do A Day podcast where I bring you some of the most inspiring people in the world. Maybe that's saying too much, but I think it's pretty true. Talking about really like how they've come through difficult times, what inspiration they found, and most importantly, how they've turned that message outward to try to help other people do the same. And today I have such a perfect epitome of exactly that. And he's actually a part of my own journey. I know he didn't know that when he <laughs> said yes to do the show. Um, but this guy's awesome. His name is MC Yogi. And he is a world-renowned yoga teacher. He's a musician and he's an author. He's performed and taught yoga everywhere, from headlining festivals and nightclubs to performing in the Forbidden City in China and even at the White House. And when he's not on the road, MC Yogi and his wife Amanda teach yoga in their home studio. Uh, in Northern California, outside of San Francisco. He is amazing. First of all, it's a pretty cool way that I discovered him. So my son actually found his album at a local health store um, where they had like, you know, music on display that you could listen to. And it's hip hop tied to notions of yoga and Buddhism and Hindu um, stories around, you know, the, the history and the religion and the stories behind the gods and the messages that they have. And it's just, it's catchy. It's really well produced and it's actually some pretty cool lessons. And I just took to it. And the more I listened to it, it sort of became the narrative of my life while I was writing do a day. Um, so that's why it's like, it's a key part of this podcast even existing. So when I was going to start to put the podcast together, I realized he had a book out called Spiritual Graffiti, and it's all about his life story, which is an amazing story of transformation and overcoming and how he found yoga and that that was such a key part of how he transformed his life. Just, it's just pretty awesome. And, you know, it's not like, oh, he just had a few trials and tribulations. Like, there's pretty serious stuff going on in his background. He you know, lived in a youth home. There's drugs involved. He was on the wrong side of the law, and like it, it could have just it could have gone in a very different direction than where it went to. And I know personally because I've seen it and I've read his story and I've talked to the guy. Huge inspiration, huge growth, um, just a beautiful soul. And like, if you don't like hip hop, you may not like his music, but it's awesome. Like, it's really good stuff. Very catchy, but it's also. Uh, it's just great music, and it's great to listen to while you're trying to do better for yourself. So I will rush right into this from this point because I can't wait to share MC Yogi's message with all of you. So with that, here is MC Yogi. MC Yogi, thank you so much for being here. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit starstruck because you are like one of my personal favorites, and your music has been the soundtrack to a lot of my journey in putting this book out. So this is... Uh, Big moment of awe for me. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, Brian. Appreciate so it. So aside from just geeking out and wanting to have an excuse to actually get to talk to you, your story is is the real thing that brought me to you. Um, you know, I've, I've read your book, Spiritual Graffiti. I've listened to your, your music and you talk about some of that journey yourself. But I want you to share that out with other people. So give us, you know, give us a little bit of that background, your your backstory, how you came up, you know, what you went through that, I mean, you, you went through some serious trials and tribulations and, and a path that would not have, I don't think anyone would have expected it to end up where it did. So tell us about that journey, that path. 
Well, uh, no journey is a straight line. And there's a lot, like you're saying, there's a lot of bends and twists and turns. In, uh, and I talk about that in, that in my book. But so basically a little bit about myself. So I grew up uh, in the Bay Area, uh, was a graffiti artist, got deeply involved in hip hop and started uh, rhyming and, and writing songs and, and performing when I was, you know, 13, 14 years old. And I just started to get into a world of trouble because, um, you know, I got fell into like drugs and violence and all kinds of stuff. Um, and I ended up getting kicked out of three schools, failing my way through all my classes and, um, you know, getting suspended and expelled and then end up living at a group home for two and a half years after getting arrested a bunch of times. And, um, it just was kind of going downhill fast. And a lot of my friends were on that sort of same path, you know, overdosing on drugs. A lot of them were involved in heavy narcotics and ended up in juvenile hall going to prison. Um, so I committed suicide. And, and so, um, when I went to the group home, I started the, you know, the process of healing myself, turning my life around. Then when I graduated that program, I found yoga thanks to my dad. And that's when the doors really started to open wide inside of me. Um, all those doors that felt locked for so long, you know, I felt numb, depressed, anxious, disconnected, um, stressed out. And before I discovered yoga, I didn't really have an outlet besides my music and my art, but my music and my art was sort of leading me um, toward more trouble. And then when I found yoga, uh, my music and art started to, to change shape and everything started to point in the same direction, which was toward healing and freedom and, and uh, you know, essentially redemption, like turn, turning things around. Can I, can I ask you a question about the the pre-yoga period? Two things are, I'm wondering about. How much of that was was it was it like a, a mindlessness like just sort of falling through life or was it something more like were you actively doing bad like is it just you kind of got caught up in it and things were happening or was like you were a badass you know what i mean like was this more intentional or just sort of the way things turned i'm um, well, it's always a mixture a little bit of both like it takes your participation and your willingness to kind of fall into that into that you know negative patterns and and habits and and addictions and uh, there has to be some sort of uh you know permission granted in order to get involved with all those things and at the same time you know i was young and just kind of going along with the crowd but um because i wasn't always like the instigator you know i wasn't the one selling drugs i was the one you know helping my friend to package it and stuff mm -hmm. like that like i was never the leader so to speak I was always following, but whenever you're sort of caught up in that kind of pattern, you know, you have to, you have to give consent, you know, you have to like agree to do all those things. So I was responsible, guilty by association. And, um, that was a big thing that I found and discovered in my yoga practice that, you know, there's a saying that the Buddha has, it says, if you find yourself walking with fools, it's better to walk alone. But if you find yourself walking with a, a true friend, then go with them all the way. And I, I discovered a different kind of people when I started practicing yoga, but I discovered myself to be a different kind of person. And so I began to sort of connect with you know, people who are more focused on being um, constructive and, and doing things that were a little more um, healthy, being successful. And so... And I'm still in touch with a lot of my old friends and, you know, a lot of them have changed as well. But um, I had to disconnect and unplug and, and really create space and distance from a lot of those people in the beginning in order to kind of get right inside myself. And then from that place, I started to attract different people. Um, yeah. So I to the short answer to your question is, yes, I was making all those decisions i take responsibility yeah. for all that um i was lost and confused and suffering and in a lot of pain but at the same time you know i was committing yeah. to those things so you you went through a lot with your parents divorce and a lot of like 
half the kids in this country dealing with that. Was that was that the root was that the root cause of things, or was there? Do you think there was more to it than that? No, there's a lot more to it. It's you know, if you read the book, it's you know, it tells the story of um, you know when things started to fall apart. You were young, um, but everything. Yeah. Yeah, everything, but look, looking back, it's all necessary. Like, I, I felt like, at, looking back, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, I made some mistakes that I probably would go back and redo, but the grand, in the grand scheme of things, looking at, like, how everything sort of broke and fractured and and got, you know, messed up, like, it was almost, like, necessary. Like, I had to go on that journey in order to discover, in order to be who I am today. Like, you know, there's. I, I remember John Lennon said, like, if he didn't have such a messed up childhood, he would have ended up becoming like a dentist. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I I feel like in now from the position of today, I can see that the pain and the suffering was actually a blessing in disguise, and it took my practice and my meditation to really strip it down, unwrap it, look at it from a different perspective, and realize that it was actually a gift. I just had to understand. And, and and be in that question of like, why did these things happen? And really heal them so that I could get to the other side of them and look back and see, wow, this was like, this was a blessing. This curse was actually a blessing. But when you're in the middle of it, it's really hard to understand that the things going on are actually, um, there's a lot of light inside the those dark times. But um, sometimes you have to be able to, you know, do the work to get through it, get to the other side, look back and extract the jewels and gems from yeah, those I, things. I totally agree. I think that we never appreciate in the moment, yet we probably wouldn't grow the way that we needed to if not for those trials and tribulations. Yeah, everything grows in the dark. You know, like if you look underneath the, if you look at, you know, planting seeds and everything, in order for something to grow, you know, it, it starts in darkness and, and then it has to break through to the other side. And, you know, it incubates. So, you know, I, I went through that and, you know, I'm grateful I made it to the other side because some of my friends, I feel like, didn't necessarily make it all the way through. Like they got kind of pulled down and, and destroyed themselves, whether it was through suicide or drug addiction or, you know, so many different um, ways to, to self-inflict pain and suffering. And I was fortunate that I found a path and a practice to help kind of lift me up, pull me out, and point my, point my life in a better direction. Well, I want to talk about that and, and yoga specifically in a minute, but there's something. So as I was reading the book, there's something that stood out to me because you do you do give yoga a lot of credit um, for that turnaround, and I know your wife is also part of that, and there were other mentors and, and people in your life that were helping you through it, um, helping you see the path. But I also found something in you that seemed to want better. So like you mentioned, living in, in this group home, um, you were kicked out at one point and you fought hard to get back in. And at least in your book, you talk about how you recognized if you were ever going to have a shot, you had to get back in there. And I think a lot of kids in that situation would have, you know, would have been fighting being there in the first place, let alone fighting to get back in. Like there's, there seemed to be this inner desire to survive in you that maybe set you up for being able to see what yoga was able to do for you. Do you see it that way? Well, I was, um, I was at the group home just a couple of days ago talking with the guys and one of the teachers there, Mr. Borsha is an amazing teacher. He was teaching uh, mathematics when I was there and um, I was talking to him and he was telling me, you know, I asked him, I says, do you see a difference between like the boys now and like when I was there? And he said, yeah, one of the things he's noticed is that this generation is, is a little more entitled and um, they take things for granted and they expect everyone else to do the work for them. And he said they're great kids and, and a lot of them are working hard. Um, but after hearing that, I went and spoke with the guys and, you know, I talked a little bit about my journey and what it was like living there and, and, and how I became successful, you know, by really developing, you know, my passion and what I love. And the one thing I said is there has to be a uh, insatiable hunger, desire, and fire to want to be better and do something meaningful with your life and, and to make people proud of you and to be proud of yourself. And for a long time, I was really numb. I didn't feel connected to 
myself, let alone anyone else. So I, I felt kind of broken and, and sort of disconnected. When I started to practice yoga, it it started to strengthen that fire inside of me to want to heal. Like the, I started to develop the, um, I started to develop, you know, when you get a taste of something and then you know it's possible yeah. and so you want more of it, but not in a negative way, like an addiction where you get like, get like some pleasure and you just, it's insatiable. You want more and more and more and you can never fill that hole or that gap. Well, in yoga, I've, I experienced directly, not through a book or a philosophy or a teacher or a priest or an institution or a religion. I experienced in my own nervous system in my own mind, in my own bones, in my own blood, what it felt like to feel peaceful, happy, and, and full of bliss. And I'd never felt that before without drugs. And the first time I had that taste, I realized that it it was possible. I realized that it existed to feel that good in your body, um, in your heart, in your mind. And once I tasted that, that's all I wanted. Because I, it was like, a, it was like a, a life raft. Like I took refuge in it. I was like, I want this more and more and more. So I did. I developed a I'm trying to find that word. It's like you develop a like when you have that experience. Um, and so I, that became my 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 desire was to get out of my own way. And I realized that it was going to take a lot of strength and effort to unclench the fists. And it's still a work in progress. Like I stumble all the time and I mess up, and make mistakes. But thanks to my practice, I have tools and techniques to sort of reconnect and get back online. Yeah, that's that's really crucial. So that I mean, that's what I wanted to ask you is why yoga and what? Because I think people hear yoga and they think it's a gym class. And well, it's really it's a, really it's yeah. meditation for me. Like yoga is everything that primes the canvas so that I can get to meditation, which is that concentrated experience of feeling completely absorbed and present and focus and calm and clear and connected. And to me, that is like a result of meditation. So all the yoga, the gym class, all the contortion and all that stuff is amazing and great and powerful. And it can help you sustain, you know, your body so that you can do the work to develop a meditation practice and experience. So I don't want to throw it out because it's, it's valid and it's, it, it saved my life, but it was just the finger pointing at the moon. It yeah. wasn't the moon. It's not a, uh... It's some people talk about, you know, go running and that's their, that's their Zen. That's it. It's not the physical side of it. The physical is there and it, it helps, but it's about, that's one piece of the puzzle to bring the centering, to bring the peace, the calm, the focus. Yeah. The physical discipline is a reflection of your commitment to get up mm -hmm. and do something. And so it's really, I, you know, I know, also know I spent a lot of time with a lot of monks, a lot of swamis, um, and some of them don't have a physical practice at all. And and you could see it in their body. And it's not good. And then there's people I know who just have physical practices. They don't have like a meditation practice. And they're extremely fit, you know. But their mind is like not grounded and connected. Yeah. And so there's extremes on both sides. So real, really the aim is to have that, that middle path where you have a regular physical practice, whether it's running or stretching or sports or whatever it is so that you're taking care of yourself so you can deal with all the hormones and all the energy and you know all the chemicals that naturally are rushing through the body um you need some kind of practice because it's a lot of energy to deal with and then the spiritual practice is so that you don't get attached to all that you know all that physical stuff because eventually the body is going to go so you want to develop like a deeper practice that, that's not just superficial and physical. So for me, yoga is the perfect balance because it's physical and mental, um, spiritual yeah. and emotional. It kind of hits all, it hits all the points for me. So yeah. it just works. And I feel like as a society, we want the reductionist answer. We want the one thing we can do for 30 minutes or whatever. And right. Move on. But you're absolutely right. It's about a, a holistic balance for your whole life. It's not a one little corner of your life you do better, and then everything else doesn't matter. Yeah, and I'm st I'm still learning that, man. That's such a deep lesson to realize that it's, you know, this idea of of being integrated and holistic, and you know, I feel like this this healing path is is a lifelong journey, 
Um, and there's no quick fix. It's a marathon, yeah. not a race. And that's actually, I mean, to some people that might be a turnoff to me, that's half the beauty of it. Cause that means you keep learning, you keep growing, you, you get a chance to keep feeling better and in new ways. Yeah. It's humbling. Um, yeah. and I feel like if people can just stick with it for a minute and give it a shot, um, there's a lot more you can achieve if you're willing to go down that path. Well, that's one of the things that I, I was talking about that came up for me when I was talking to the to the guys at my own group home who were all like, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, kind of where I was, you know, when I was at that age, they're kind of going through a lot of the same stuff. And so for me, I said, um, I, I just was reminded that I, I was, I sucked in the beginning. Like I was not a great, amazing artist. I wasn't a great um, poet or songwriter or any of those things. And I had to fail and, and make a lot of mistakes. And I think oftentimes, because there's so much instant gratification in our culture, if you're not good at something right away, you don't really stick with it long enough to really become good at it. And for me, like now, you know, I'm a graphic designer, I'm a graffiti artist, I'm a muralist, uh, you know, I write and produce music. You know, I just, you know, I wrote my first book. All that happened because I was really, really bad in the beginning and I was not good. And, and even like I'm still, you know, getting better as I go, but there has to be some kind of commitment or willingness uh, to to be not amazing and to learn as you go to get better and better and better and better. And uh, I was just really lucky because I had certain people in my life, um, like my my dad and my mom and my wife. And, you know, they encouraged me. And um, they didn't mind being embarrassed by me when I was really bad in the beginning. I gotta write that down. There has to be a willingness to be not amazing. It's it's yeah. true. Um, I want to talk about your music for a minute. And um, it was really cool for me reading the book to hear how a lot of the songs came to me from this this trip to India, um, the concert that you all put on, and. Um, that was it's just cool hearing like the genesis of all that and then as a listener of the, of your sounds to hear the uh the journey that your music's been on so it was you know early days more of like a, a beastie boys kind of feel and your latest album is more i don't know if edm is the right word but it's like it's a lot more zen and mellow and some of the stuff you've done on some other albums like on trip tracks and stuff it's it's less about the lyricism or the emceeing maybe I'm not being a music guy, like maybe I'm completely off on this, but I've, I've seen this, like this arc in your music and this transition. I'm just curious, like from your end, as you're going through that, what's, what's the path, what's the transformation or is there one? Or is this just like, I'm just making what comes to me. I'm just, yeah, I'm just kind of experimenting and again, making a lot of mistakes. <laughs> like, you know, um, I put out some records that I really love and I put out some records that I'm like, Oh, okay. I, you know, this is not really a, a, a reflection of how I feel today, but it's a work in progress. It's, it's sort of a body of work that reflects like a greater sort of journey that, that I've been on. And, um, yeah, it's, I feel like my music is like, it's my, um, it's my notebook, you know, it's like my sketchbook. It's, it's just like my notes along the way. It's like what I'm learning, what I'm discovering, what I'm into, what I'm really like vibing on in the moment. Like I put out that, you know, recently put out an ambient record um, with my friend East Forest. You know, before that, I put out kind of a bigger record, Only Love Is Real. That, Which is awesome. You know, we... And the and the remixes oh, thanks, are bro. also like, I love that album. I appreciate that. I mean, I really like some of those remixes a lot. And we, we had a really good squad of people that were putting a lot of love and energy into those tracks and uh, worked with my friend Trevor Hall and uh, Modest Yahoo and just got to collaborate with some great artists and friends. And um, But now I'm kind of getting back to my roots right now. I'm in the studio producing a new record, some new songs. And, um, you know, it's just a constant ex experimenting and, you know, it's working really hard and then being detached. It's that combination yeah. of, you know, doing your best work and then releasing it. And it's that's always an ongoing process. It's it's not always yeah. easy. I will say. Well, that. So you've you've you're, you've used the words attachment and detached and non-attachment a few times. So these are Buddhist principles. 
Where's, where do you fall in the religious structure? I mean, you, you have a song that talks through some of that religious journey. You've been to some of the most religious places in the world or, or spiritual, maybe is a better word for it. So where do you stand in all that? Because you've been through some serious highs and some serious lows. And those are things that oftentimes you see people completely separate from religion and spirituality, spirituality or completely dig into it. Um, I'm, I'm curious where you fall and, and what kind of things you believe in, not, you know, not about whether you believe in God or not, but just sort of like, what are the values that have stood out to you as you've been through so much of this journey? Uh, well, I do believe in God. The God that I understand and, and connect and relate to is, is really truly the power of, of love and redemption and connection it's really the energy of the universe. You know, it's, it's nature. It's the goodness inside people's hearts. It's, you know, when you take away everything else, like what's left, there's light, there's love, there's, there's an energy, there's a presence, there's a power. I don't trust religion, um, necessarily as an institution in terms of, uh, how it manipulates people and separates people and categorizes people. I think that that's dangerous, but I think what religion is pointing toward is beautiful and uh, amazing. And so again, it's like, you know, there's that famous line that I mentioned earlier that Bruce Lee said in Enter the Dragon. And, you know, in an interview, Bruce Lee, when he was putting that philosophy into his films, like he got a lot of flack and the studios didn't want to do it. So he had to fight really, you know, he had these incredible fight scenes, but the real fight that he was engaged in was this battle to like share Eastern philosophy you know, on this mainstream Western stage. And, you know, he, that's why he was so amazing, why he broke through. And, um, he has that famous line, enter the dragon says, don't stare at the finger pointing at the moon. Look at what the finger's pointing at. Otherwise you'll miss all that heavenly glory. And I think religion is just a finger, you know, it's pointing towards something. All religions are essentially pointing toward the same thing. And you have to be careful that you're not getting caught up in the, sort of the costume of it or the surface of it, um, but really doing the work to dig in and realize what's at the heart of it, because what's at the heart of it will set you free. It's it's your own journey back home, back in. It's your redemption. It's your reconnection. Going from being broken and fractured to healing and being whole is really the point of all religion. Um, but, you know, as human beings, we tend to complicate things and make things very difficult and obscure yeah. things. And uh, it's part of the path, you know, it's, there's, there's a purpose for that as well, because otherwise we wouldn't really have a story to tell if everything was just easy. Um, so I met this incredible winemaker and he told me that he grew his grapes on the side of a mountain because it gave the grapes more character because they had to work harder to grow. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, we're given these challenges or maybe we give them to ourselves. Who knows in the grand scheme of reality, like, you know, how it all works is kind of a mystery, but I think that there are, there are challenges and, and issues so that we can appreciate things more and that it gives us more character. Um, so I, I know this is about you, but I got to ask you about 10,000 Buddhas. It's your wife's project. Yeah. Yeah. So where, how many Buddhas is she at? What is it about? What's the, and, and I want to understand this for your work too, is like, ultimately, why are you guys doing what you're doing? What's, what's the outward focus of it? Uh, I think it's a reflection of an inward focus, to be honest. Like, so my wife is a muralist. She's a, a graffiti artist as well. And she, we took this journey to India and she witnessed these um, cave paintings. It's the oldest art in the Buddhist world. They consider it the Sistine Chapel of Buddhism, and it's in the heart of India. And we took this journey to these caves and experienced this incredible art. And she got inspired by this fresco she saw, this mural of a hundred Buddhas meditating together. And, you know, we travel all around the world together teaching classes. I mean, we've taught a yoga class to over 10,000 people. Um, you know, we've taught yoga at the White House and in China. To me, it just blows my mind. I, it's it's hard to re I have to pinch myself because if I if when I was living in the group home, you know, to imagine all the things that have happened thanks to to yoga and my teachers, it's just absolutely yeah. mind blowing. Like, I, yeah. it's hard to process, to be honest. 
But um, I met and fell in love with Amanda in San Francisco when I was living with my teacher. And the thing that helped to win her heart was one night I had painted a mural for her, a graffiti mural up on the rooftop in, in downtown San Francisco. And I talk, I, I share the story in the book and it's That's pretty sweet. Story. But, but ever since then, we've been on this journey making art together. And when we went to that pilgrimage to India and she witnessed that those Buddhas, she couldn't get that image out of her mind. And for years, she just kept thinking about it. She started drawing them, having dreams about them. And, and then finally one day she decided she would, she wanted to see them again. So she painted them. She did her own version of them and it took her about nine months to do this oh. oil painting on wood and it actually hangs in our yoga studio in Point Reyes. We have a little studio called Point Reyes Yoga in Northern California. And, um, she had seen me painting graffiti murals with spray paint and she thought to herself, man, I want to paint more of these Buddhas. So one day as she was painting another one, she, she heard this voice inside of her and it said, you should paint 10,000 as a practice, as like a discipline. But she realized she was, she would never be able to probably paint 10,000 in this lifetime because it took so long. So she got the idea of doing um, spray paint and stencils. And she started to paint these murals and one led to another mural and another mural. She started doing them in Washington, D.C. and L.A. and in Hollywood and down in Panama and Germany. And started getting all these invitations all around the world because people really fell in love with her project. And then one day she was painting in her studio and she had been counting each one, but she had forgot to keep track. So she decided to count them up and she realized that she had just painted 10,000. Um, and so now she's still painting them and, you know, we traveled together and, uh, it's, it's been pretty amazing. I'm really deeply inspired by her, her commitment. And she is an incredible yeah. artist. She is truly, she's amazing. That's really cool. And that's, um, that's a beautiful way to leave a mark out in the world of something positive and inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. And what's been, it's been sort of an experiment because, you know, she'll, like in Miami, she did a huge mural um, across the street from this place called Wynwood, which was like, it's one of the biggest graffiti, outdoor graffiti museums in the world where, you know, amazing artists like Shepard Fairey and Cryptic and Cope and all these people I grew up just admiring. And here she is painting this massive mural right next to all these like luminaries. And I'm just, my mind is blown. And And then after she painted it, I would just watch and see how people would react as they would you know, walk, walk by it. And then almost every single time people would start doing yoga in front of it. Oh, so it elicited awesome. this like spiritual response where people were having this moment of peace and, you know, they smile and, and take pictures in front of the Buddhas and feel that moment of connection. I thought, wow, that's such a cool way to like bring this energy of yoga and meditation and mindfulness out into the world. So I'm, I'm really inspired by her. That's awesome. I have to say it, it shows really strong through the book. Um, I mean, obviously from listening to you right now, but the relationship that you guys have and the amount of inspiration that has to just be, you know, alive all the time with it, which, which is, that's, that's a, everybody should have that. That's pretty inspiring. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm, I feel real lucky because essentially I, you know, I married my best friend. Which is not, not just a cheesy saying. Uh, you know, yeah. No, I no, mean, I mean no, it really real. comes across. Like, That's pretty amazing. And you guys are aligned in the same well, direction. Yeah, I mean, she. We both teach. We both we're both artists, and we both been there for each other during, you know, a lot of ups and downs. Like people really close to us passing, and you know, just traveling and and you know, being on this journey together has been just beyond what I could ever have imagined when I was a lonely 16 year old in a group home dreaming of yeah. one day having a girlfriend. So what about you and why you're doing what you're doing? Is it, are you just caught in this amazing creation kind of world where you, you keep putting things out or do you have a, a goal? Like, is there a purpose to all this? Are you trying to achieve something? Uh, really for me, it's just, I have a, a hunger and a desire to, to, be better. You know, I want to be a better artist. I want to be a better musician. I want to be a better teacher. I want to be a better human being. 
I want to, I want to learn how to like refine my craft. I want to deliver my bars better, my words, my poems, my stories. I want to paint better. I want to draw better. I just, I want to like master this, you know, whatever I'm doing. I just, I want, I want it to be the best thing possible. Um, and I don't know where that comes from, to be honest. It's just, it's, it's, I don't know. I think it's probably, you know, a bit, it bends back to yoga and meditation. It's, I want to see what's possible, essentially. Like now that I've gotten a little taste of what's, you know, what's possible, I want to, I just want to stretch and under, I want to see what, what can be done. Like, what can you do with one human lifetime? How much art can you make? How many songs can you write? How many classes can you teach? Like, what's possible? I'm just really curious. Like, how can it, you know, how could it get better than this? I'm really interested in that. That curiosity, um, the curiosity for what's possible, for possibility, that, that's, that's kind of infectious and powerful. And it's awesome to hear that, you know, that's a big part of what's driving you. Um, what about just knowing the amount of inspiration that you have on other, like when you're in front of 10,000 people teaching them yoga or when you're up on stage and, you know, people are, are feeling what you're saying? I have to be completely honest with you, man. I don't really like, I don't really think about that. Like, I think I'm, I'm too focused and on, on my work and I don't really think about, I don't give a lot of oxygen or energy to the result of my work. Like I'm honestly really critical of my own work. Like I'm so focused on trying to learn and understand how to do what I do in a, in a better, more honest and authentic way that, you know, I love when a crowd is responding and dancing and having fun. Like I live for those moments because there's a feeling of connection, like it is working. But in terms of like inspiring people and doing all that stuff, like it's not really in my head. Like I try not to concern myself with that too much because I'm, I just try to do my best to do yeah. do what I do. And and beyond that, it's kind of out of my control. And I, I don't, I don't kind of get mixed. I try not to get mixed up with that too much because it, it seems like a distraction. So you're, you're doing better for your own sake, regardless of what anyone else might think or not think about it you're still going to move ahead and try to do as much and as, as well as you can it really keeps yeah. me focused man like you know and I, I like to go back and like talk to the you know i do you know work with the guys in juvenile hall and, and work with the group home just because i enjoy it you know it's i don't feel like an obligation to do that i feel like i actually genuinely enjoy talking with them and connecting with them and listening to them and like sharing with them but I don't feel like I'm not a savior yeah. being, you know, like I'm not current and I'm not like a, a priest or a relig you know, that's yeah. not my job. Like I'm a, I'm an artist, you know, I'm doing my thing. I'm sharing my story. And if it helps people, awesome. But ultimately it's just, I feel like this, this thing inside me that's just compelling me to do it. And I, I just have to listen to that. You don't, you don't get hung up in judgment, which is what so many of us do is, you know, well, well, I do, I do get hung up in judgment and criticism and doubt and fear and anxiety and stress, like all the time. Because I think when you're putting stuff out, I am my yeah, own biggest. But not critic. external judgment. You know, I, I, I hear what people say, um, but it's really not my. I think the the voice of intuition, the voice, the creative urge to 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 make stuff. Um, the desire to improve the that voice is louder than all the other voices That's great. Um, because you know there's an old saying in the yoga tradition praise and blame are two sides mm. of the same coin people will praise you and put you up on a pedestal say you're this and that oh my god you're so amazing and then those will be the first people to kick that stool from underneath you and you know as soon as you disappoint them a little bit they they knock you down and that's a game that the world mm. plays with leaders and all kinds of stuff. And I'm just, I think my yoga has informed me that that is not healthy. Um, it's not healthy to project all that stuff onto other people at the detriment of you doing your own work. It's really important to have, yeah, have people that inspire you. I, ha you know, I love Bob Marley. I love Bruce Lee. I love Muhammad Ali. Those are icons and luminaries. And I love the BC boys and run DMC and all these people I grew up enjoying and, and love. You know, and I really enjoy their work. Um, and I've had great teachers along the way, but the, the, the greatest realization I've had in my life 
is that that's all wonderful and good if it's really getting you to do your own work and your own dharma. If it's a distraction from you doing your own work, then it's just fantasy. You're kind of wasting your time a little bit. So I just choose to say focus on on my on my craft, on my art, and um, that's more important than than all that other stuff. That's beautiful. I mean, it is because that keeps you on what you actually care about and what matters to you. And then, then you get to actually build a life that matters to you. Like it's your life. It's not anybody else's. It, and it's very easy to give your power away. Like don't yeah. stop it. You know, don't do that. That's dumb. Like you, maybe you've done it a few times in the past. Stop doing it. Don't do it anymore. Like <laughs> bring the energy and the power back to your own practice. Like, Develop your own capacity to free yourself from yourself. A teacher can't do that for you. A song can't do that for you. A book can't do that for you. Like it can encourage you and point you in the right direction. But again, those are all fingers. Those are all fingers. It's not the point. It's what the finger is pointing at. You know, it's your own story. It's your own song. It's your own poem. It's your own journey. It's your own healing. Keep bringing it back to that and stop investing so much in um you know becoming codependent because it's just it's not healthy like you got to become your own you essentially got to become your own liberator yeah. i love that so what what's next you mentioned you're you've been recording some new stuff what's your next because i i would never have seen the book coming so what are what are the other left field kind of creative things that you've got going mm-hmm. on if you can share what they are bro <laughs> Dude, I I did not see the book coming at all. Like I, that just happened. Like it came to me. I I don't even. I can't even begin to express how grateful I am to that publisher, Harper One, for taking a chance on me because they basically approached me because of a podcast, <laughs> and they said, "Hey, you got a you got an incredible story. We'd love for you to share." It. And I wasn't planning on writing a book. I was planning on maybe at best making a comic book, but um, which I'd still love to do, but. I don't know, to be honest, like, I, you know, I'm, I think the future is always going to be a reflection of what's happening in the present. Like what, whatever I'm doing now is going to open up the door to whatever happens next. But right now I'm just working on my songs. Um, did you do working on my do the artwork? Go ahead. Book? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I drew all the art in the, yeah, that was fun. Yeah. I love, I, love, I just love making yeah. stuff, you know, cause it kind of gets me it helps to get me out of my head just to like put my pen to the page or, or just turn, turn a track up and just like nod and get into that trance of just, you know, crafting words. And and it's just very meditative. And I, I just love the process. That's a really consistent thing throughout the book is there's always like in every story, everything that's going on, there's always some, you know, you've got your sketchbook with you or you're out, you know, you're, you're out doing graffiti work or you're, creating some rhymes or poetry like you've always got some creative outlet throughout so much of that journey which i think is really cool yeah i guess that's a good i mean that's a great observation i i kind of yeah i get i never really realized that but i think at the end of the day i'm just kind of working class man like i i like to work like i like to I like to build stuff, whether it's words or paint a mural. Like I just like creating. There's something kind of liberating in the moment of creation. Um, and then I tend to get in trouble after it's made, and then I try to like figure it out. Like, you know, is this is this good enough? Um, as long as I'm creating, I'm happy. I yeah. get the feeling your mind is always in creation. I think ultimately the present moment is the moment of where all, we are all co-creating this reality together That's right true. now. I think the big bang's happening right now. It's not back then. It's like it's all happening right now. It's all we ever have is a present moment. Yeah, and this I've been really sort of tripping out on that and like the present moment is not just like what I'm experiencing with my senses, it actually encompasses the past and the future. It stretches out infinitely in all directions. All possibilities are present in this moment. And it's really our choice what we want to sort of focus on, develop, and dwell on. Like, what what do we want to build? Um, and just bringing the power back over and over again, like bending my mind back. Distracted, bring it back. Mind wandering, bring it back. You know, not doing 
what I'm supposed to be doing, mm. bring it back. You know, it's like, I call it BIB, bringing it back. Like, just keep bringing it back, yeah. bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And, and I just, I think I've been developing this pattern of doing that so much that it starts to create a rhythm. You know, there's a repetition and a power in that pattern where it becomes easier and easier to reconnect. So hopefully I'm getting better as I move forward. I'm just going to keep consuming what you're creating and it's all good from my end. <laughs> well, so where, where can other people consume your creations? How can people get a hold of you and what you're doing? Well, you can enjoy, you know, enjoy the story. I mean, spiritual graffiti is, it's a fun book. I mean, a, a woman came up to me yesterday, we were at a festival and she said, man, I got your book. I read it in yeah, two hours underneath the covers with the flashlight. I was like, are you kidding me? That is amazing. And you know, I've had people say they've read it and just, it's a, it's not dense. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's just a fun journey with some ups and downs and some twists and turns. And, and it's just my, you know, it's authentic. It's true. It's like, it's what, it's what happened. And, um, it was a fun process to write that book. Cause I got to reflect and look back and see how incredible this journey has been of like, actually the fact that I survived and I got to spend time with these incredible yeah. people these musicians and teachers it's just absolutely like i you am go in on awe your honeymoon of, and mike d's in the yoga class that you guys go to yeah, yeah i bump into one of the bc boys yeah it's yeah it's amazing like the universe the universe has a great sense cool. of humor i really i really believe yeah, we'll that. say you know there's a lot of a lot of people tell their stories and people who have stories that have chaos and, and hardship a lot of times those stories can be hard to follow this was like I, just, I got it. Like the, the chapters are not too long, not too short. The stories flow. They're interesting. You didn't really lose me. You know, sometimes you're reading a book. It's like, wait, I don't really know who he's talking about right now. Or how did that happen? It's out of sequence. It's all just pretty natural. So I could see maybe two hours a little fast. You might be a quick reader, but yeah, you just take it in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it was, uh, man, I, maybe one day it'll become a graphic novel or a comic book. That That'd would be, be pretty cool. cool. So mcyogi.com, is that the best place to, to find you? Where, where are you most active? I would probably say Instagram. Instagram is like, that's on there most of the time. Um, Spotify, iTunes. Uh, my wife is 10,000 Buddhas on Instagram. It's fun to follow yeah, her process. Great artwork her process. Very cool. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you hanging out with me and taking the time just to Yeah, to man. A hundred percent from me to you. Like that that's uh I'm still giddy over it and it's happened now. So I'll I'll get yeah. over it at some point. And and I gotta say, like my son He's waiting to hear whether this happened and how it went. He's he's the one who introduced me to you. Oh, that's cool. Which is kinda funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah no he, way. That's a That's awesome. Yeah, no. So my my whole so my whole family's into you. Um, but anyway, thank you so much for the time today. And um, yeah, appreciate you, man. Yeah, Thanks, Brian. And just you know, you you kind of got at it a number of times, but today's a new day. Hundred percent. Go out and do it. God, I love that guy. He's awesome. What a message he has. What inspiration, and the things that he's been through, the path that he's been on and where he's taken it to and i say taken because that's a verb that he chose to go where he went through the inspiration he took from yoga it didn't have to be that way you know he was introduced to yoga and that's great but it's not like yoga just magically changed his life he accepted it he grabbed onto it and he took his life in that direction really really inspiring i love that comment he made about everything growing in the dark like how important is that you know we we look at dark times and a lot of us fold. A lot of us say, why me? We don't necessarily realize that that may be our point of growth. That may be what we need to go through to get to the other side. So that's you know such a crucial, crucial point. Like seeds need to be buried deep, dark in the ground or they'll never sprout. They'll never have a plant. Love it. Uh, MC Yogi, you've got to check him out. Of course, I will link up everywhere. But his music's just awesome. Spiritual Graffiti is a great read. It doesn't take a long time to get through, and it's a great story. And he's a great storyteller, which is you know part of why he's such a good musician, good artist. 
Um, so check that out. And, you know, like I said, I'll link to all that. But you can go to mcyogi.com and find everything there. Uh, and you can check them out on Instagram and Twitter and all that. And, of course, me too. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, at Brian Falchuk. And um, subscribe to the podcast. You know, this is the kind of stuff you're going to keep getting if you subscribe, if you choose to listen to it. MC Yogi, others that bring inspiration, help you change your life for the better. So I'm not going to take any more time because you can use that time to go download his music, subscribe to this podcast, follow MC Yogi and me, and start turning your life to a place of better. Remember, today's a new day. Go out and do it.